Our next speaker is Dr. Jason Submorelli, a medical instructor and director of research at the Duke Comparative Oncology Group at the Duke Cancer Institute. Dr. Summarelli completed his PhD at Florida International University and his postdoc at Duke Medical Center, where he now co-leads a team focused on understanding cancer through the lens of comparative and evolutionary biology. Dr. Summarelli's research innovatively bridges medicine and conservation. So welcome, Dr. Jason Summarelli. Can folks hear me okay? Yeah. So it's kind of hard to follow the flamethrower guy. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, that was phenomenal. Um, so uh, I'm a cancer biologist, and uh, the vast majority of my colleagues view cancer solely through the lens of the human condition. And uh, my, my argument is always to them, and the same to you, you're missing a lot of uh, important information by ignoring the rest of our, our diversity. Uh, and this idea of comparative medicine or, or one medicine really uh, started with Rudolf Virchow, uh, Rudy for short. Um, and, and he said, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line. Uh, the object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. And he was actually more right than, than he knew at the time. He was a pathologist, so he saw these things, uh, these similarities between human and animal uh, uh, pathology. And, but, but this was recently published, and it's, it sort of just looks at the tree of life. Um, I think, I don't, I'm not sure if I have a pointer, but it, it, it looks at the tree of life, and everywhere there's a, a red or an orange uh, square. This is a group in which cancer or a cancer-like phenomenon has been observed. So this is not solely uh, a human-only problem. This is a tree of life problem. This is a problem of truly multicellular organisms. And comparative approaches in medicine can be really helpful, particularly for diseases where there's, there's not a lot of access to human patients, so rare diseases. This is a survival curve through time of, uh, for osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma is a, a rare but very painful and very aggressive uh, primary bone cancer. Uh, it, that occurs mainly in children. Um, so you can see pre-chemo to single agent to combo chemotherapy, we've made great strides, right? We've gotten a lot accomplished uh, with that. But since then, we've really gone nowhere. So new approaches are really needed and new models are really needed uh, to tackle this problem. And for metastatic disease, uh, the problem's even bleaker, about 25% survival at five years. Um, so it turns out that, that our pets get a lot of cancer. Dogs get a ton of cancer. Um, that's 16,000 new cases in the US and 6,500 new deaths, uh, cancer deaths each day uh, our, our pets, our dogs, are getting cancer. And so that's about three to five times more than even humans. Dog and human cancer share our, our genetics. They share our environment, so they, they eat the same food, for better or for worse, as we do. Uh, they, have, they share a clinical presentation. Um, and we can run clinical trials in, in the veterinary space at a fraction of the cost, so one-tenth uh, to, to about a hundredth the cost. It costs several million dollars uh, minimum to run a clinical trial in, in the human setting. And our group is finding and has found that almost all of the drugs, about nine out of ten of the drugs that we, we can kill dog cancer cells with, we can also kill human cancer cells. <laughs> so our, our group really has worked hard in the past few years to develop what we're calling a personalized medicine pipeline that crosses species. So we take patients, and it's agnostic of species at this point, dogs or humans. We directly implant tumors into immunocompromised mice, and the tumors grow there as patient-derived xenografts. We perform uh, high-throughput drug screens using naturally-derived compounds that also include FDA-approved uh, medicines and anti-cancer therapies. We're coupling this with genomics so that we understand the underlying biology in a personalized way for each tumor we get. And then we feed that information back 
to the treating veterinarian or physician so that they can have improved uh, uh, decision-making processes. So I have something to compete with, with a flamethrower a little bit, <laughs> and it, it just a little, and it's cuteness, right? So I got, I got the cuteness card. So uh, this is Odin, and Odin uh, is a 10-year-old pug, and he was diagnosed with a soft tissue sarcoma. And I went, I was digging through the histo report, and we got, we got his tumor to characterize it to do the same thing we're doing. And I, I just saw this quote, and it, it struck me, because this could be your child, it could be your family member, it could be your pet, uh, it could be any of those things. And it said the neoplasm uh, is incompletely excised, and therefore recurrence is likely. So what do you do for a, a patient, and this is truly a patient, that's has no other options because after surgery, there's only uh, intensive chemo, and if that fails, you, there are no other options. What we're doing is applying our pipeline. So we're screening the same patient cells with 2,100 bioactive compounds in high throughput. Uh, we're perform performing cell viability assays that give us a list of pathways that we can target. Um, and then we take those targets to the patient-derived xenograft that's growing in the mouse currently, and we can show, we can demonstrate efficacy in vivo. And that's about all the proof of principle that you need to then make the case to veterinarians that, hey, we should at least try this when there are no other options in a, in a rare case like that. So that's sort, of the, that's sort of the pipeline that we're using. The other thing that we're doing that, that you know, is I'm growing more excited about is uh, we're, we're using nature's laws and, and what we've evolved to better understand how to package uh, drugs that we currently have, reformulate them. So uh, typically, most cancer drugs are hydrophobic. It means they sort of hate water. So, um, well, there was a video, doesn't matter. You can see on, on the left, oh, arrows, cool. Yes, thank you, good idea. There is a keyboard and a mouse, I could use it. So, <laughs> it's not all here. Um, so what happens is when the drug hits the blood, that's an aqueous environment, it just precipitates out. No drug is getting to the tumor in that case. It just turns into solid. So this brilliant uh, engineer and chemist, David Needham, uh, actually works, works at Duke, he thought, well, the, the body, we, we transport fat all the time. Fat's hydrophobic. Why don't we just figure out what the body does naturally, what we've evolved to do, and just mimic that? So what, what it turns out we do, which I kind of didn't know this, I should admit, but what it turns out we do is we use LDLs, low-density lipoprotein complexes. So what he did was he said, well, I'm just going to mimic that. I'm going to make a nanoparticle that's an LDL, but inside, instead, it's not fat, it's hydrophobic drug. And with these nanoparticles, we can deliver 25,000 molecules of drug per nanoparticle. So when we, when we test this in our animal models, what we see is that nanoparticle in, in green here uh, inhibits tumor growth at the, about the same efficacy as standard chemo. And that's great. Uh, it, it doesn't improve on it, but it does about the same. And chemo does pretty well, but the problem with chemo is it's really toxic. So what, what we're measuring on the right is just change in weight of the animal, and that's just sort of a surrogate of the animal's overall health. And what you can see is that any time chemo is introduced, you see this terrible drop-off in, in the animal's weight. And that's not the case for the nanoparticle. So about day 10, we had to stop chemo, whereas we could continue that uh, nanoparticle treatment throughout. So I'm really excited about the promise of this and, and sort of tweaking this a bunch more. And I'll finish up with one more sort of burgeoning area of research and, and fascination for me. Um, and this is sort of what gets me here, you know, through folks like Sam, and, and thank you guys for the invitation. Um, so it, it turns out the marine uh, environment is really a, a largely untapped resource for comparative medicine approaches. We know it makes up, you know, about three quarters of the, of the earth, but it contains 80% of all life and an enormous diversity of uh, biochemistry. 
and, and we really think, our group really thinks that it holds vast potential. And the example is that about two-thirds of our anti-cancer compounds currently come from natural products, but just less than 1% of them are from the marine environment. And that's not because they're not there. It's because we're not, we haven't looked yet for them. And we haven't developed the technologies like all of you folks are developing to do that. So I'll end, I just want to end with this. I, I think it's an important forum to, to just mention this. I'm sort of looking at everything backwards from all the rest of you, right? I'm looking at how the, the world can kind of help us. And I, I think that most of us in this room, probably all of us in this room, would uh, appreciate and understand that the natural world and its natural systems have inherent value without providing value to us. But especially in this day and age, not everyone shares that viewpoint with us. And so comparative medicine and, and showing through comparative medicine the value to folks uh, who don't share our worldview brings them to the table in a way that I think trying to force them to your viewpoint wouldn't. So I just want to kind of plant that in your minds as you move forward. So uh, again, you know, you mentioned eloquently, you, you can't do anything on an island. And so these are all the folks, uh, both through funding and, uh, and co collaboration, who've helped with this. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.